Bonjour, Stephanie here. Before we get started today, I have an invitation for you. I could not be more delighted to invite you to join us for our fifth anniversary. Yes, Gospel Spice was born five years ago. And so we are gathering to celebrate God's faithfulness to us all and to delight in each other's presence. So make sure to save the date and to join us for a live in-person event here in the Westchester area, just outside of Philadelphia on Saturday, October 26. And that will be a morning event from 9.30 a.m. till about 12.30. We're going to open registrations very soon. And here's what's going to happen on that day. There's going to be a keynote by my dear friends, Oz and Jenny Guinness. They're going to inspire us with their many decades of humble wisdom and truly influential service to our generation. There's going to be a panel with several of my dearest friends who are all authors with national and international influence. Lisa Jo Baker, Christy Purifoy, Chris Hall, Philip Carey. They've all also been guests on Gospel Spot. And there's going to be a time to meet with these wonderful authors and speakers around their own book signings, food and drink and fellowship with one another. And there just might be cake. So make sure to save the date, Saturday, October 26, and make sure to be signed up to our newsletter because that's the best way to find out the details and to sign up for registration. I really, oh gosh, I really can't wait to see you there and celebrate with you God's faithfulness. So please join us. It would be such a delight to spend this time with you. Now, today's episode. Bonjour and welcome on the Gospel Spice podcast, where you are invited to taste and see that the Lord is good. Gospel Spice is your Christ-centered podcast, infused with in-depth biblical flavors and sprinkled with a dash of French culture to spice up your relationship with God. Here is your host, Stéphanie Roussel. Bonjour. We're picking up on last week's episode on using the French language to identify examples of good and bad pride in scripture so that we can understand when it is good and right to be proud of something or someone and when it is not. Last week, we looked at humility and pride, and we looked at the two words, both translated pride in English. In French, these two words are orgueil, which is always bad pride, and fierté, with the adjective fier, proud, which is mostly good. I promised you that today we would draw conclusions based on all of our study to determine one bad foundation for pride and at least four good reasons to have pride that are all obviously based on scripture. Obviously, you need to have listened to last week's episode for today to make sense. So I'd invite you to do that if you missed it somehow. Now, the results themselves that I'm going to share, they may not surprise you and hopefully they won't because you're steeped in scripture. But it's always interesting, isn't it, to come up against a topic or a concern or an issue just from a slightly different angle. I'm probably not going to say anything new to you, but hopefully the way it's being packaged around the words orgueil and fierté in French are just going to bring some fresh light and kind of tie maybe some loose ends for you, hopefully. And the reason why I'm not expecting you to be necessarily surprised is because the results I'm going to share paint a biblical picture of pride. And again, like I said, you're a serious follower of Jesus, which which means you are extremely familiar with what the Bible says. And <laughs> you also have the Holy Spirit guiding you. So obviously he's going to guide you into all truth. Now, what I hope this is going to do is paint a clear picture for us of when and how we can exhibit and even promote godly pride in ourselves and in our children. So what is bad pride? Scripture is pretty clear. Ungodly pride is self-centered. Across the Old and the New Testament, all of the examples of orgueil and some of those ten fierté that are negative are all about human-centric pride. I've quoted a few of them so far without qualifying them as such. I want to quote now the only three negative mentions of pride or boasting in the New Testament. And I know they're negative because they're pretty obvious. So in the Old Testament, plenty of negative examples of pride or boasting. And remember last week, we saw how boasting and pride are really interchangeable. So I'm, I'm using them like that. And again, 
I'm only looking at verses that in French are orgueil or fierté, regardless of the English translation. And again, 60% of the cases, it's going to be pride. We don't know good or bad. There's going to be boasting, which again, we don't know if it's good or bad. And then there's the obvious bad ones, haughtiness, arrogance, insolence, um, and, and all the things like that, which by the way, also have French equivalents. So only three, only three in the entire New Testament are negative mentions of pride and boasting. So I'm going to read them to you right now. Romans 2, 17 in the ESV. You call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God. This is Paul talking and he's not mincing words with the Jews here. Romans 2, 23 NIV. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? So these two are pretty obvious because they have to do with boasting in the law and because it's really about trusting in self for salvation. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's, look, he's talking to the ones who follow the law, the ones who said, even if you're a Christian, you have to do the 10, you have to obey the law of Moses. You have to eat, you know, particular foods and you have to be circumcised and you have to do all the things that a Jew would have to do. And then you can also be in Christ. And he's saying, no, 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 no. Because when you do that, you're trusting in self for salvation, not in grace through faith in Jesus. Trusting in your own works, trusting in the law rather than grace. That's what he's saying. And I think we can all agree that the entire gospel is about grace because we're absolutely unable to rely on the law to save us. We're unable to keep the law. We just completely are unable to do that. So that's two out of three examples. The third is, is even clearer, if anything, Philippians 3.19 in the NIV, their destiny, and he's talking, this is Paul talking about the world, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, this last one is interesting because in all major English translations, it's the word glory, their glory is in their shame. But it's negative, and it's fierté in French. Now, that means, and again, I said fierté is mostly positive. Once in a while, it's negative. And in this case, um, it's the case because their orgueil, their fierté is in their shame. That means that because there's 30 references to pride or boasting in the New Testament, and there's only three negative, that means all other 27 instances of boasting or pride in the New Testament are positive. That's 90% of all the references or admonitions to pride in the New Testament. They're positive. In 90% of the cases, the New Testament tells us to be proud. So, proud of what and when? What is good pride then? What is biblical boasting? What is the place and time when it is appropriate to exhibit that perilous word for ourselves, that word glory or pride? Okay, first, um, so like I said, I identified at least four categories. Here's the first. It's always rightful and good to place our pride or boasting in God himself. No surprise there. This is what Paul was saying uh, in the, the passage we saw last week, 1 Corinthians 1.31, when he says, boast in the Lord. But that's actually not only the case in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's the same. Now I'm going to read some verses about boasting in God in the, New, in the Old Testament. And by the way, remember when Paul quotes that passage in 1 Corinthians 131, he's actually quoting Jeremiah. So boasting in the Lord, having pride in the Lord as a positive thing, that's an ancient concept. That's an ancient truth from the Old Testament. I'm going to read a few. And these translations do not always have the actual word pride or boast in English, but they use the French fierté and the Hebrew equivalent gaon. So it is about pride and it is about good pride and it can sometimes be glory. So pick up as I'm reading the English, imagine where that good French word fierté would be located here. First Chronicles 16.10, CSB, boast in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. We're boasting in the name of the Lord. Psalm 34.3, that's one of my favorites. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That was the NIV. Psalm 105.3 in the CSB, boast in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. And that's actually a perfect quote from 1 Chronicles 2. Isaiah 41.16, but you will rejoice in the Lord. You will boast in the Holy One of Israel. So clearly that's a theme in the Old Testament. And it's a theme in the New Testament. Romans 5.2 
we boast in the hope of the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 10, 17, CSB, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Galatians 6, 14, we've seen this one before. In the CSB says, Paul, as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Which is a way of saying, actually, it's slightly different from boasting in God, but it's kind of the same idea. Philippians 1, 25 to 26 in the NIV, I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Philippians 3, 3, Paul continues in the NIV, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh or in the law, by the way. So he's saying putting your confidence in the law is bad. Putting your confidence or boasting in Christ Jesus is a good idea. And so this, this last one here kind of sums it up. We boast in the Lord, not in the flesh, which again, that was that negative boasting in the law. And, and please, again, hear that these verses in French all have that word fierté in common, good pride. Okay, so boasting in the Lord, being proud of the Lord and, you know, the cross and of Christ. Again, that seems pretty straightforward as a believer, but there are other places, several other places or reasons to boast. I was going to say apart from the Lord, um, but we're going to see that they eventually loop back around to a boasting in and of the Lord. So there's actually no contradiction in scripture, <laughs> which is probably uh, obvious as well. Well, obvious, I don't know if it's obvious, but when you dig, there's no contradictions in scripture. Just, you know, it's, it's a complex truth. It's not simple. It's not black and white. It's very, very, very nuanced. So the boasting in what seems to be people or things outside of the Lord, actually these, they're going to loop back and we're going to find that they're actually an elaboration on the boasting in the Lord that we're called to. Okay, let's be logical here for a minute. Not that we haven't been so far, so that was silly to say. Um, if we are called to boast in the Lord, then it makes sense that the Lord should boast in the Lord. Hmm. In other words, it makes sense for God to be proud of God, not arrogance or haughtiness, but a fully developed sense of self-worth. If you've been around Gospel Spice for any length of time, and especially if you've done our God's Glory or Delight series, you know that God is, by definition, the epitome of love, joy, peace, power, majesty, beauty, excellence in all things. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, that is better or greater than God and, and even equal to Him. Because if there was, then that thing that is better than God would dethrone God and be higher than God, so become God, right? And that can't be because God created all things and therefore all things that are created are by definition inferior to their creator. The superior always creates the inferior, not the other way around. From the finite cannot come the infinite, but from the infinite comes the finite. From the superior, the inferior comes, not the other way around. So God is supreme in all things. And that is why we can view the whole of creation in one category and then God in another category all by himself. We are all created and he is not created, which is also why he's called holy. Holy means set apart, separated, different, unique from the rest, really a category all its own. So literally God is holy. He is a category all his own. We are separate from him because we are created. So picture two um, containers, if you will. One has the entire created universe, everything that is, everything you've ever seen or heard or, you know, anything that has ever existed within the created order. And then on the other box is God, which obviously he doesn't fit in a box. So my analogy breaks down right away. But you're, you know what I'm saying. These are two categories. They're distinct. And one is vastly superior to the other. So for us who are in the box of the created universe, it makes sense that we should boast in him. And that's the good kind of French fierté. We should be proud of him. We should have deep pride in him because he is literally a category all his own, vastly, infinitely superior to us. 
And therefore, it also makes sense that he should boast in himself or be proud of himself. He has a perfect sense of self-worth. He's the only one who does, actually. He's perfect in glory and in humility. He's perfect in majesty and in gentleness. He's perfect in power and in meekness. And like, we can't wrap our heads around that. And that's exactly the point. He's infinite. And so we cannot contain him inside our little finite brains and minds. Because if we could, then he too would be finite. He could fit inside a finite box. But he can't. That's the whole point. So God rightfully, justly boasts in himself. That is the essence of glory. Just one example, Isaiah 63, 1 in the AMP, in the Amplified. Who is this one who is glorious in his apparel, striding triumphantly in the greatness of his might? It is I, the one who speaks in righteousness, proclaiming vindication, mighty to save. Oh, I got goosebumps. That's our God. Okay, but like, what's, do you want to know the crazy part? God doesn't just boast in himself. He boasts in us. He's proud of us. And that's where I just completely met. And again, remember that these are all what I'm going to read to you about God boasting on being proud of us. These are all the French fierté, positive pride. Isaiah 60, 15. He speaks of Jerusalem, but through her, of all believers in the CSB. Instead of your being deserted and hated with no one passing through, I will make you an object of eternal pride, a joy from age to age. Did you need to hear this today? It is so beautiful. Let me read it to you, not in the CSB, but in the NIV this time. Although you have been forsaken and hated with no one traveling through, I will make you the everlasting pride and the joy of all generations. That's a promise. And it's a good thing. So we are the pride of God. God also invites us to be proud of all that he will accomplish for us in the future. Isaiah 61, 6 in the CSB, but you will be called the Lord's priests. They will speak of you as ministers of our God. You will eat the wealth of the nations and you will boast in their riches. So we will boast in the riches of the nations, meaning by that we have been blessed abundantly by the Lord and called the Lord's priests. That's a good boasting. That's a good pride. Ezekiel 39, 13 in the King James, it shall be to them a renown the day that I shall be glorified, says the Lord God. That word renown is fierté in French, and that's following um, the Hebrew here. Literally, what the King James says, if I mix the King James and the French, it shall be to them their pride, the day that I shall be glorified, says the Lord. So we take pride in the day that God is glorified. And to be glorified is to be put on the ultimate pedestal of pride in a good way. James 1 9. So that was Old Testament. James 1 9 knew believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm going to read that one again because that one sounds somewhat countercultural in our Christian circles. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. Believers in humble circumstances should take pride in their high position. So when you are humble, then you are in a high position. And you should take pride of that. When your circumstances humble you, whether because you are in poverty or in suffering or in hardship or in a humiliating position for the glory of the name of Christ, that's when you take pride in your high position in Christ. James 1, 9, all of that. Hebrew 3, 6 in the CSB, Christ was faithful as a son over his household. And we are that household if we hold on to our confidence and the hope of which we boast. Of course, hope. You've done the series, so you know that it's espérance. But that hope and that confidence in which we boast. What are we invited to boast or to take pride in? That hope 
that sure hope, espérance, that we are in Christ, the sure boast that we who are humble have a high position. Do you see how Hebrews and James echo one another here? Humility and boasting are in the same verse, in the same sentence. That means it's possible to boast in humility, to, to be humbly proud. Hmm. Okay, let's, let's recap so far. We're almost done here. It's possible to be humbly proud. We've seen three things so far. We can be humbly proud of the Lord. That's who God is. And we spent some time on that. We can be humbly proud of the Lord in the sense of what he has done for us and what he is promising to do for us in the future. That's the second category. So first, we can be humbly proud of who God is. Second, we can be humbly proud of what God has done, is doing, and will do for us. So all of his actions, his identity, who he is, that was the first, and what he does, his actions, is the second. And then we just saw a third category. We can be humbly proud of who we are, our position in Christ, our high position when we are in humble circumstances, our high position because we are the household of Christ from the Hebrews 3, 6 verse. So we can take humble pride in who God is, what he's doing, has done, will do for us, his actions, and then who we are in Christ, our identity. Now, I want us to see the fourth area of humble pride we can embrace. We've seen We can be proud of who God is and what he has done. We can be proud of who we are. And I want us to see that we can be proud of what we do too. What we do in his name, the acts of faithful obedience that we are called to humbly bring forth into this world. Here's a sentence I'd like you to remember. We can be proud, humbly proud to be the hands and feet of Jesus because he is perfectly humble and meek. And it If Jesus is perfectly humble and meek, and we saw this in Philippians 2, how could we exhibit boastful, arrogant pride if we take pride in being the hands and feet of the meek one? And so we can safely take pride in one another as his hands and feet. There's a lot of verses I'm going to read to you to uh, back up this claim. Galatians 6, 4 in the CSB, let each, let each person examine his own work and then he can take pride in himself alone, not compare himself with someone else. By the way, you can't be humbly proud and at the same time compare yourself with someone else. That's a warning right there. Pr- good pride and a sense of comparison to others do not go have it. It's one or the other. Humble pride will not allow you to compare yourself to someone else. Even another person in Christ who is the hands and feet of Jesus. You just, there's just no health. There's nothing healthy about comparing. Galatians 6, 4, that was it. Now, Romans 15, 17 in the Amplified, and I'm purposefully using different translations here just to give you different flavors of those verses. Romans 15, 17 in the Amplified, then, in Christ Jesus, I have legitimate reason to glory exalt pride in my work for God in what through Jesus Christ I have accomplished concerning the things of God. So there's good reason. I mean, the Amplified is clear. I have legitimate reason to be proud of what through Jesus Christ I have accomplished concerning the things of God. That's huge. Now, (laughs) the, the caveat is that can I be honest or is it just me? Like most of the time, God does not allow me to see um, the work that I have accomplished concerning the things of God. Most of the time we're unaware of the work he's doing through us. He keeps us humble by keeping us unaware of how we're producing fruit for others. To, and, and that's a great thing, but that doesn't mean we can't be humbly proud of it. Romans fifteen seventeen, right? Okay, let's keep going. I, I want you, I want to feed you verses that I hope you're going to cling to as pure, unadulterated truth, because that's what it is. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Uh, This is Paul talking to his beloved and, and highly messed up Corinthians. He says in the NIV, I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, wait a minute, Paul. This is 1 Corinthians. Literally at the beginning, you said, 
The only thing you're going to boast about is Christ and Christ crucified. And here you say, I boast about you in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's boasting about the messed up Corinthians. Well, yeah, he is. He's boasting about their real, albeit sometimes misguided efforts to follow the Lord. Oh, oh, I love this so much because Paul, Paul is saying we don't have to have it perfect to be a source of pride for one another. So do not look for perfection in yourself. Don't wait until you're perfect to be proud of what the Lord is accomplishing through you. Otherwise, that's going to wait till heaven. And then don't wait until others have it perfect to be proud of them. Lavishly express your humble pride over others being the hands and feet of Jesus, even if it's not perfect. Because those Corinthians, man, they were messed up. And yet, I think the Corinthian letters are the ones where Paul expresses his pride over a particular congregation the most, and they were the most messed up ones. So it has nothing to do with perfection. I think it has to do with a heart, and it has to do with a humble desire to follow the road when you don't have it all together. And that gives me a lot of hope and comfort because that's where I am. Uh, Speaking of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.12 in the NIV, Paul talking again, we're not trying to command ourselves to you again, but we are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. Now, That's interesting because there's a contrast between a noble thing to take pride in one another and a much less noble thing to take pride on, appearances, what is seen, what is not in the heart. And here, interestingly, after Paul says, I'm proud of you, he says, you should be proud of me too. So there's a one anothering happening here that is absolutely beautiful. And pride is, it's not, this is not arrogant pride. This is the good kind of pride. Obviously, Paul is not narcissistic in this. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, I'm telling you, the Corinthians, they're all over the map when it comes to to pride. Good and bad, mostly good in this case. In the NIV, Paul, I've spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I'm greatly encouraged in all our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. Now, 2 Corinthians is a whole lot better than 1 Corinthians. The, The relationship has changed. It's his third, maybe fourth letter to the Corinthians, the second we have, and uh, the tone is very different from first. And it's really interesting because as far as we can tell, the the Corinthian church, even then, was still the most messed up of the ones that Paul wrote to. And like I said, it's the one that he expresses his pride of the most. And uh, a few more examples, 2 Corinthians 8.24 in the ESV, give proof before the churches of your love and your, and of our boasting about you. Now, this one, this one is worth pondering. They didn't have their act together, and we know that. But those Corinthians were intent on following hard after the Lord. And so Paul praises them. After all, they're the ones to whom he said, follow me because I follow Christ, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1, which means that Paul himself is not afraid to take good, appropriate pride in his conscience before God. And we see this in 2 Corinthians 1.12. Indeed, this is our boast, says Paul. The testimony of our conscience is that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially towards you with godly sincerity and purity, not by human wisdom, but by God's grace. Wow. So his conscience is so clear before God by the Holy Spirit that he boasts of the clearness of his conscience that he conducted himself with sincerity and purity towards the Corinthians. That is incredible to be able to have that clear of a conscience. And that is something that the Holy Spirit can give us. Now, Paul also boasts in hard things. Romans 5, 3, we also boast in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Afflictions, he boasts in that. He's proud of his afflictions, but it's a humble pride. It's not arrogance. It's not him saying, well, look at how much harder I have it than anyone else. Even though he does that a bit in Philippians, but he calls it foolishness. 
But here he's really clearly in Romans saying he's boasting. It's a humble, it's again, it's good pride. It's fierté. He's boasting in his afflictions, but he's also boasting about the work of his hands. Romans 5, 11. So literally a few sentences after this one, he says, and not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received this reconciliation. Now, Paul here is saying he's boasting in God through Christ, through whom he's received reconciliation. I think it's safe to say that if Paul is proud of this, then God is proud of this too. God by the Spirit is speaking through Paul. It's not Paul's opinion that matters primarily. It's the Lord's. And they're the same because God has allowed these words to reach us as the canon of scripture. In other words, Paul is saying about our afflictions in Romans 5, 3 and the work of our hands, Romans 5, 11, that together our afflictions and the work of our hands produce reconciliation. Paul basically says it's the same thing. Is there someone who needs to hear this and be encouraged? God takes pride in your work of reconciliation. Even as the context that requires this work of reconciliation, even if that context causes you great affliction and it is not easily achieved, God sees you and takes pride in your work of reconciliation. Oh, I, I, you need to hear this, my dear fellow worker for reconciliation in the name of Jesus. He sees you and he is proud of you. Now, 2 Corinthians 10, 13, we need to keep going. 2 Corinthians 10, 13 in the CSB, we will not boast beyond measure, but according to the measure of the area of ministry that God has assigned to us, which reaches even to you. Now, uh, what he's saying here, I'm only going to boast and take humble pride in within the territory of ministry that God has given me. I'm not going to pilfer from someone else's ministry. I'm just humbly proud of what God has done. And this to me confirms that Paul's words to us are God's words to us because we are under the jurisdiction of Paul, the territory of Paul, because we're reading his words. The very fact that you and I have the letters of Paul that we are reading, that we've been sifting through today, that shows we are within Paul's ministry. We are part of his sheep. We are under, we are within his territory. We are under his spiritual authority, even as we are reading his letters. And he says he's going to boast within the measure of the area of ministry that God has assigned it to him, which reaches even to us, he says. In other words, Paul is boasting about you and me. It's very much like the John 17 prayer where Jesus prays for those who will believe through the word of the disciples and the apostles. That's you and me. Paul is seeing down the lens of time, obviously not with the clarity that Christ had, but he's realizing that his letters will have an effect to people who will read the letters potentially after Paul is long gone. No kidding. 2,000 years later, we're still doing this by the Spirit of God. And we're being edified and, and built up. We are part of Paul's spiritual descendants in Christ. And he boasts in us. So there's a very acceptable, holy, agreeable place for humble pride in the work of our hands and feet, just like Paul is proud of the work of his hands and feet in Christ Jesus all the way down to us. First Thessalonians 2.19, for who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at this coming? Is it not you? That's in Thessalonians. So here, Paul isn't talking to the Corinthians we've hung out with so much, but Thessalonians. Paul is saying here, he's boasting in them and in you and me. In others, that's the final category of proper pride, one another in Christ. It is right and good to be proud of one another in the Lord when we are doing the good work He has entrusted to us. When we are growing and committed to growing in the fullness of His love for us through one another. And then take 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you among God's churches, about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and afflictions that you are enduring. Do you hear this? Okay. 
Let's sum it up as we're ending. God is rightfully proud of himself. That is a given. And we are right when we are proud of him too, when we boast in him. And when we boast in what he is doing in and through us. Now remember, boasting is humble pride. There's a humility there. There's no arrogance. There's absolutely no sense of superiority whatsoever. So God is rightfully proud of himself and uh, we should be proud of him too, in a good sense. Now, orgueil, pride, is always negative when it is rooted in self, self self-strength, self-ability. I can do this, I got this. So, of course, it's also the uh, look at me version of boasting. It's the Pharisees. It's the people who think they can save themselves, that they are self-sufficient, that they can do this, that they can measure up. That's always negative, orgueil. But more often than not, in the New Testament, pride is a positive thing, fierté, something to embrace because it is rooted in one or more of the following categories. The Lord, who he is, that's what we just saw. Also the Lord, what he has done for us and is promising to do for us in the future. So everything that the Lord is and everything that the Lord has done, does or will be doing, that's the Lord, who he is, what he does. And then we have biblical reasons to be proud in who we are or position in Christ, which by the way, we have done nothing to accomplish. This is sheer grace. And then We also have reason to be humbly proud, humbly boasting in what we do in his name, the acts of faithful obedience we are called to humbly bring forth into this world in his name. And then the final category that I would suggest scripture clearly teaches we have a right, even a duty to be humbly proud of is one another. When we see others doing for the kingdom the rightful and righteous acts of obedience of the saints. And so when you sum it all up, at the end of the day, Paul is right. Boast in the Lord only. Because who we are and what we do when these are things that are worth being humbly proud of, it's always because they are rooted in who God is and what he does has done or will be doing in and for us. So, yes, Paul is right. Boasting, being humbly proud, fierté is always rooted in the Lord. Who he is, what he does, who we are, and what we do in his name. And I pray that you will go through your days with these categories in mind so that you will know when your pride is truly to the honor and glory of your beautiful, mighty, meek, humble, glorified Lord and Savior. May it be so. Amen. Hi, Jonah here. Thank you for being part of the Gospel Spice family. If you've enjoyed this episode, you will love receiving our newsletter. It contains value-packed free gifts and rich content each month. It's at gospelspice.com slash sign up. There is always something new and exciting happening around here, and I don't want you to miss out. Sign up at gospelspice.com slash sign up. Did you know Gospel Spice has a YouTube channel? There's exclusive content there too, so join Gospel Spice on YouTube. Also, please give us a star rating and a comment on your podcast listening app. Your reviews actually really do make a difference to help others discover and experience Gospel Spice. As always, we are praying for you. You can confidentially email us your prayer requests and praise items at the email address contact at gospelspice.com. It's our privilege to pray for you. So, I'll leave you with four things to do. Please pick one and do it at your convenience. One, sign up on our website for our newsletter to receive gifts you're going to love. Two, find us on YouTube and see what content we've put together to help you grow closer to Jesus. Three, rate Gospel Spice on your listening app. It's one of the easiest ways to share the gospel. And finally, four, tell us how we can pray for you. Merci. Merci.